Number 1. Lisa resided with her mother and stepfather in Texarkana, Texas. She received a telephone call from a male friend at approximately 12.30 a.m. on January 15, 1999. A vehicle driven by an unidentified individual arrived at the residence by 1.30 a.m. Lisa entered the car and has never been heard from again. She did not share her plans with her family members, as she was allowed to leave the house whenever she wanted. They assumed she had left with a friend and would be back shortly. Lisa was carrying her house key at the time of her disappearance, prompting her mother to believe her daughter expected to return home. Her parents said it is uncharacteristic of Lisa to leave without contact for an extended period of time. She left all of her personal belongings behind, including her clothing, purse, makeup and curling iron. Lisa's relatives said that they did not notice any behavioral changes on her part prior to her disappearance. Lisa was a high school senior and transferred to Bowie County School of Success the day before she vanished. Her mother said that Lisa decided to leave Liberty Alau High School as the result of minor problems with several students and teachers. She also hoped that the transfer would permit her to graduate early. She received above average grades and had solid relationships with her parents. Most of Lisa's friends were older, and her mother said that her daughter desired her own independence. Lisa was enrolled in the Distributive Education Cooperative of America in early 1999. She has experience working in various fast food establishments. Her disappearance is classified as a runaway with most agencies, though it's unclear whether she did in fact leave of her own accord. Number 2 Stanley was last seen in Modesto, California on June 3, 1986. She completed a two-week sentence for a drug charge and was released from the Stanislaus County Women's Facility on Oakdale Road that day. She called her family and said she would get a ride home with her boyfriend. No one in her family had met the boyfriend or even knew his name. Stanley was last seen getting into a blue or green truck. She has never been heard from again. She left behind two children, including an eight-month-old infant. Wesley Howard Shermantine Jr. and Lauren Joseph Hartsart, the so-called speed freak killers, are possible suspects in Stanley's case. They were arrested in 2000 and ultimately convicted of murdering several females in the 1980s and 1990s, authorities believe they had as many as 15 victims. Photographs of both men are posted with this case summary. Shermantine is on death row. Hartsarg's sentence was reduced from 78 years to 14 years after the court ruled his confession had been coerced. He was paroled in 2010 and then took his own life in January 2012 after he found out his former partner had begun cooperating with authorities and had offered to reveal the location of victims' bodies in exchange for a payment of $33,000. Shermantine led investigators to the skeletal remains of Javel Wheeler and Cindy Vanderheiden, who'd been missing since 1985 and 1998 respectively. He also pointed out an abandoned well in Linden, California, that contained some 300 human bones and personal items. Shermantine stated the well contains up to 20 victims. He blames Hartsarg for all the murders and says he only helped with disposing the bodies. Authorities are in the process of sorting out the contents of the well and attempting to identify the bones. Shermantine and Hartsarg are being investigated in other missing persons cases, including Philip Martin, Michaela Garrett, Susan Bender, Gail Marks and Ruth Lehman. Victims Kimberly Billy, a 19-year-old who disappeared in 1984, and Joanne Hobson, a 16-year-old who disappeared in 1985, have already been identified. Some agencies may list May 29, 1986, as the date of Stanley's disappearance. Her case remains unsolved. Number 3 Alex visited his girlfriend on the morning April 24, 2004. He was moving items to their new home on Harbor Road in Northport, Maine that day. At 5.20 p.m., one of Alex's former high school teachers, who lives on Pound Hill Road near Bluff Road, behind Jeff's Marine, saw him come running out of the woods near her home. The location is about a mile and a half from Alex's new home. The woman says Alex was acting paranoid and erratic and appeared to be hallucinating. He told her that bad guys were trying to hurt him. Her husband tried to get Alex to remain at the scene while the woman called the police, but he ran away before authorities could arrive. Shortly afterwards a motorist saw him crossing Route 1. He has never been heard from again. Alex's van was found the next day in a small parking area off Pound Hill Road, on property belonging to the Waldo County Humane Society. His keys and cellular phone were inside the vehicle, but there was no sign of Alex. Several searches of the area failed to turn up any evidence as to his whereabouts. 
In September 2004, a contractor in Jackson, Maine, about 45 minutes away from Northport, reported seeing a man who matched Alex's description. He says he was working on a house when the man, who had a sweater tied around his waist, came out of the woods. The man was acting strangely, would not speak, and did not seem to understand anything spoken to him. The contractor offered him food, but the man refused. A person living nearby says he also saw the unidentified man, and he also believes he was Alex. The second witness says the man came to his garage but would not answer questions and eventually walked away after being told to leave. These sightings have not been confirmed but are considered credible. Alex's parents say he has never left without warning before, they believe he may have met with foul play. They say he had the skills to survive alone in the woods if he had to. Alex was employed as a freelance gardener in 2004. He enjoys skateboarding, reading and playing the guitar. His case remains unsolved. Number 4 Bowie was last seen at Lennox Apartments where she lived in the 2100 block of Gables Drive Northeast in Atlanta, Georgia. She was abducted from the parking lot. Five witnesses heard a woman scream for help at 11 o'clock or 11.15 p.m. and then saw a maroon 2002 Mercury Sable driving off. Inside the vehicle were two men in their late 20s or early 30s. One of the men was heavisit and bearded. One of the witnesses memorized the car license plate number and called 911. Police found items including a woman's green jacket, jewelry, a manila folder, a broken perfume bottle, a container of chicken wings, eyeglasses and two broken fingernails scattered in the parking lot. The car scene leaving the scene was located the next day, abandoned and burned. It was badly damaged. On July 7, authorities arrested Jasper Keels and charged him with the theft of the car. He had borrowed it from an acquaintance on July 4 and never returned it. A photograph of Keels is posted with this case summary. On June 20, two weeks prior to her disappearance, Bowie and her fiancé, Shernata Rico Walters, were arrested on felony charges after the police found marijuana and a handgun in her vehicle. Walters was driving, he had borrowed the vehicle from Bowie. Bowie had no prior criminal history and maintained she had no idea how the drugs and gun got in her car. The charges against both of them were eventually dropped, but Walters was jailed because he was on parole and possession of a gun constituted a violation. He had served time on drug charges two years earlier. He was still incarcerated on the day she disappeared. Authorities questioned him about Bowie's abduction, but he is not being called a suspect and her family does not believe he was involved. It is unclear whether the criminal case is connected to Bowie's abduction. She has no prior criminal history. She and Walters planned to get married on March 30, 2007. Bowie had worked as an exotic dancer for a time after she moved to Atlanta from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1999, but only for a few months. At the time of her disappearance, her main source of income was from doing accounting for various clients. She also owned two businesses. GO2 Girls Promotions Incorporated, an event planning company, and Lacoca Wear Clothing, a clothing boutique. She met with her lawyer just hours before her disappearance, he says she was behaving normally and appeared to be in good spirits. Keels was originally only charged with the theft of the abduction car and with drug possession, but in September 2007, he was also charged with Bowie's kidnapping. Investigators do not know whether he knew her, but they theorize the abduction was not a random act and was connected to illegal drug activity. They stated they expected to arrest other individuals in connection with the abduction. Bowie's body has not been located and no one has been charged with causing her death. Bowie grew up in Pittsburgh with her mother stepfather and four siblings. She graduated from high school at Perry Traditional Academy, then got a bachelor's degree in accounting from Cheney University of Pennsylvania, where she was class valedictorian. She remained close to her family in Pittsburgh even after she moved to Atlanta and frequently came back to visit. Her disappearance remains unsolved and foul play is suspected. Number 5 Lisa was reported missing by a neighbor on May 1, 2007. She was last seen on April 30 at her home in the 13,200 block of Red Star Drive in Plainfield, Illinois. At the time of her disappearance she resided with her two children and her husband, Craig Stebick. He stated he last saw her at 6 p.m. She normally worked out each evening at Plainfield North High School, and he believed she had gotten a ride there. Lisa took her purse and cellular phone with her when she went missing, but there has been no activity on the phone or on her credit cards since her disappearance. She left her vehicle behind in her garage. She has never been heard from again. Craig had filed for divorce several months before Lisa's disappearance, but the couple continued to live together. 
Lisa's friends said she was looking forward to starting a new life without her husband. Craig stated that although they lived in the same house, he and Lisa led separate lives and rarely spoke to one another. On the day of her disappearance, she mailed her attorney a petition asking for Craig to be ordered out of their residence, she called him unnecessarily relentless, cruel, inconsiderate, domineering and verbally abusive, and said his behavior was detrimental to their children. The couple may have also been having financial problems, their home was mortgaged for more than it was worth, and Craig had just been laid off from his job. Lisa's friends said she was afraid of her husband and she was attending counseling sessions at a center for battered women. They had been married for 14 years prior to her disappearance. The police were called to their home in 2006 because of a verbal dispute between Lisa and Craig, but apparently no violence had occurred and no arrests were made. Craig had been convicted of felony weapons charges in the 1990s, but no violent offenses. In the days following Lisa's disappearance, investigators searched the Stebic residence multiple times and also confiscated the couple's two vehicles and a tarp found inside one of them. Some media outlets reported Lisa's blood was found on the tarp, but police have not confirmed this. Two months after Lisa's disappearance, Craig was officially named as a person of interest in her case. Authorities stated he refused to cooperate with the investigation or allow his children to be interviewed. The day after he was named as a person of interest, Craig asked the court to dismiss his divorce petition against Lisa. Police stated they do not believe Lisa left of her own accord, had an accident or was forcibly abducted, but they do believe she came to harm. A grand jury convened to investigate Lisa's disappearance in November 2007. Her two children, who were 10 and 12 years old at the time of her disappearance, were called to testify. No charges have been filed against Craig in relation to his wife's disappearance, but he was arrested for assault in an unrelated case in November 2009. He allegedly threatened a neighbor. Lisa graduated Libertyville High School and attended Southern Illinois University before transferring to Kendall College, where she obtained a degree in hotel and restaurant management. She was employed as a food assistant at Lincoln Elementary School at the time of her disappearance. It is uncharacteristic of her to abandon her children or to leave without warning, and she did not have any health issues or mental problems at the time she went missing. Foul play is suspected in her case, which remains unsolved. Number 6 Scott was last seen at approximately 4.30 or 5 p.m. in his hometown of St. Charles, Missouri. He had left his home on Leverens Drive and was walking down Ken Drive towards West Adams at the time. A heavy thunderstorm affected the St. Charles area on the day of his disappearance. Witnesses saw Scott had walking before the storm hit the neighborhood and afterwards. He has never been heard from again. He was a student at Coverdell Elementary School at the time of his disappearance and vanished on the last day of the school year. Bloodhounds tracked Scott's scent for about five miles northeast on Fox Hill Road, then lost the trail. Authorities searched numerous man-made tunnels and caves in the area and also dredged streams in an effort to locate Scott, but no evidence was produced. Some people believe he drowned in a flash flood which affected the region after the massive storm, but authorities and his family members believe he was abducted. In 2007, investigators began investigating Michael J. Devlin for possible involvement in Scott's disappearance and in several other cases, including the 1991 disappearance of Charles Arlen Henderson and the 2005 disappearance of Bianca Piper. Sean Hornbeck, a 15-year-old boy who disappeared in 2002, and William Ben Aunby, a 13-year-old boy who was abducted in 2007, were both found alive in Devlin's house in January 2007. Ben had been missing for five days and Sean for over four years. Both boys had been held against their will by Devlin, who subsequently pleaded guilty to kidnapping and child molestation, and was sentenced to life in prison. Authorities initially suspected Devlin could be linked to other missing child cases and formed a multi-jurisdictional task force to investigate this theory. In October 2007 the task force dissolved, as it could not find any evidence that implicated Devlin in any other children's disappearances. Scott's parents still live in the house they resided in when he disappeared, and they hope for closure in his case. His disappearance remains unsolved. Number 7 Roger was last seen leaving his home in the 14,500 block of Sare Street in Silmer, California on December 16, 1968. He had an argument with his father about smoking and rode away from his house on his motorcycle. Roger never returned home and has never been heard from again. His family initially believed he'd run away from home. Roger loved animals and rock and roll music in 1968. 
He enjoyed playing sports and playing the guitar, and he was close to his family, which included his parents, two sisters and two brothers. Roger's parents have died, but his siblings are alive and hope for a resolution in his case. Authorities believe Mac Ray Edwards was responsible for Roger's disappearance. A photograph of him is posted below this case summary. In 1970, Edwards pleaded guilty to killing three California children and sentenced to death at his own request. He confessed to killing Roger and two other missing children, Brenda Howell and Donald Baker. Edwards lived just five houses down the street from Roger's home and was a regular visitor there. Roger was a classmate of Edwards' adopted son, and the two boys were friendly with each other. Edwards stated he lured Roger into an orange grove and tricked him into agreeing to be tied up as part of a game. Edwards said he then stabbed him to death and buried his body under the 23 freeway in Thousand Oaks, California. The freeway was under construction at the time, and Edwards was looking at the site. He claimed he used a bulldozer to bury Roger's body. Authorities believe he was also most likely responsible for the murders of several other children and the disappearances of Thomas Bowman, Bruce Creeman, Ramona Price and Karen Tompkins. Edwards lead authorities to a site where he said he had buried some of his victims, but no evidence was located and he was never charged in connection with any of the missing children's cases. He died by suicide on death row in 1971. A photograph of Edwards is posted with this case summary. His alleged victims ranged in age from 7 to 16 years old. Foul play is suspected in Roger's case due to the circumstances involved. His case was reopened in 2007 as authorities renewed the search for the bodies of Edwards' victims. Edwards was employed as a heavy equipment operator in the 1950s and 1960s and helped construct many highways across the state of California. Investigators believe he may have buried the children's remains under the highways. In 2008, they dug a 25-foot deep pit near the 23 freeway in search of Roger's body, but the search was called off due to safety concerns. Authorities believe Roger's remains are very close to the search site, however, and his younger sister left a bouquet of flowers there. Number 8 Evelyn was last seen on the afternoon of May 16, 1955 in Los Angeles, California. She and her husband, Leonard Ewing Scott, test drove a new car that day. A photograph of Ewing is posted below this case summary. He told the car salesman he and Evelyn were thinking of moving out of the country, either to Spain or Portugal. Aside from her husband, the car salesman was the last person to see Evelyn before her disappearance. Evelyn had met with her hairdresser weekly for years. On May 17, a man called the salon and said he was canceling all her future appointments. He hung up without giving his name or an explanation. Ewing was Evelyn's fifth husband. Her first two marriages ended in divorce, and her third and fourth husbands predeceased her, leaving her with a sizable fortune which she invested skillfully with the assistance of a financial management firm. She was worth nearly $1 million by the time of her marriage to Ewing. Her assets included a share in a Milwaukee apartment house, which provided an income of $1,400 to $1,500 a month more than $220,000 in stocks that yielded annual dividends of about $8,000 and $200,000 in her bank accounts. Her passion was traveling and she had been all over the world. Whenever she went on a trip, she left her itinerary with her attorney in case he needed to reach her. Evelyn met Ewing in the early summer of 1949 and married him in September. Following their marriage, Ewing gradually assumed control of Evelyn's finances, telling her he could manage her money better than her investment counselors. He identified himself as an investment broker and land developer, but he had no source of income. Ewing urged his wife to convert her assets to cash. Evelyn cashed about $223,000 worth of securities and drew $180,000 in income from her estate during her marriage and left behind a substantial amount of money in bank accounts and safe deposit boxes. Many of the couple's acquaintances reported seeing bruises on Evelyn, and Ewing told the family's live in maid that he had hit his wife. He also confided that he didn't love Evelyn and had married her only for her money. He asked the maid to eavesdrop on Evelyn's telephone conversations and monitor her mail. The maid refused and was subsequently fired. Evelyn also dismissed her longtime secretary and friend at Ewing's urging. He told her he would be taking over her bills, banking and correspondence, so she no longer needed a secretary. Evelyn's brother openly loathed Ewing and became estranged from his sister for a time as a result. Many of her friends also disliked him. Ewing told several of Evelyn's friends that her physical and mental health was deteriorating, but none of her friends saw any evidence of this. 
After Evelyn went missing, Ewing refused to file a missing persons report and, when people asked about her, he said she had vanished while he was out buying tooth powder. He said she had left him without warning before and variously stated she was a lesbian, was an alcoholic, was mentally ill and or had cancer. He suggested she may have gone to a sanitarium, possibly on the East Coast, for treatment of her medical conditions. At times he stated he knew which sanitarium she was in, and other times he said he had no idea where she was. Evelyn's friends contradicted Ewing's description of her. They stated Evelyn didn't have emotional problems, wasn't a lesbian, and rarely drank alcohol, and when she did it was never to excess. She received psychiatric treatment for anxiety for several months in the late 1940s, but had been in good mental health for years prior to her disappearance. Evelyn did have some small growths removed from her face years before her disappearance, and afterward she was checked for cancer twice a year. She did not have cancer at the time of her disappearance. Her only medical problem was diverticulitis. Evelyn's friends and brother were puzzled and alarmed by her uncharacteristic absence and their inability to get in touch with her. Several times they asked Ewing for contact information for her, but he never provided any and gave evasive and contradictory answers to their questions as to what had happened to her. In late July 1955, two and a half months after her disappearance, Evelyn's friends asked the district attorney's office to begin a quiet investigation into her disappearance. She wasn't officially reported missing at that time, however. The district attorney's investigators discovered Ewing had been forging his wife's signatures on checks and financial documents and spending her money on himself. He was also seeing other women and gave them several of Evelyn's things, including clothing and jewelry, as gifts. He even proposed marriage to one of his girlfriends, although he was still legally married to Evelyn. One of Evelyn's friends checked with every sanitarium and mental hospital on the eastern seaboard and discovered Evelyn wasn't a patient in any of them. The friend also offered awards for information on her in newspapers all over the country, with no results. Evelyn's brother made her disappearance public in March 1956, when he filed for guardianship of her estate. He reported her missing on March 7. When police searched the Scott property, they found two pairs of eyeglasses, an upper front denture plate, some of Evelyn's diverticulitis medicine, and some women's toiletries lying on the ground in the next-door neighbor's yard, just over the wall that divided the two properties. It appeared as if the items had been there for a long time. Evelyn's dentist identified the denture plate as hers, and her optometrist identified the eyeglasses. Authorities could not find the dental retainer Evelyn wore when she was asleep, however. There was no indication that Evelyn's body had been burned in the backyard incinerator, but some charred remnants of women's undergarments were found in the incinerator. Ewing stated he had burned the underwear because it was soiled and had a foul smell. Police became convinced that Ewing had killed his wife and wanted to indict him for murder, but he was charged with 13 counts of grand theft and forgery instead in April 1956. He fled the area several days later rather than face the charges and traveled to Canada. Five months after Ewing became a fugitive, he was indicted for the murder of his wife. He was arrested in April 1957, after nearly a year on the run. He'd crossed back into the United States to buy a car and was apprehended when he tried to return to Canada. He was extradited to California to stand trial. At Ewing's murder trial, he maintained his innocence and said Evelyn had left of her own accord and probably wasn't even dead. Prosecutors theorized he murdered his wife to gain control of her estate. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. He initially refused parole, saying accepting it would be tantamount to admitting guilt. He was unconditionally released from prison, without parole, in 1978. Journalist Diane Wagner wrote a book about the Scott case, titled Corpus Delicti, in the 1980s. She interviewed Ewing extensively and claimed he confessed the murder to her during their last interview, in 1984. Ewing allegedly told her he'd killed Evelyn by hitting her in the head with a rubber mallet, then buried her body in the desert six miles east of Las Vegas, Nevada. The story has never been confirmed. Ewing died in 1987. Evelyn's body has never been located. Foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved.